Woohoo! Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Rob. I appreciate it. <laughs> Let's jump in here. So I got to share my screen. Let's do that. All right. Can we see everything all right? Yes, looks great. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about art of the crafting prompts, how to craft prompts that inspire creative, relevant content. Now, the thing about using AI is, and, and this is the, if I get anything out of uh, in this that you're going to take away, I just want you to know that AI should never, ever replace your creativity. Don't cut and paste it. Don't, you know, pop pop it into something without, you know, taking a heavy edit. It's not flawless. And as we're going to see here in the coming years, uh, or actually months, a lot of companies are coming up with tools that will be able to monitor AI created content and tell them if it's plagiarized or not. And so for your own professional uh, <laughs> um, career, you don't want to get uh, you don't want to get targeted as somebody who plagiarizes. So the thing is, I want you to know above anything and everything else is that every prompt is just a pathway. It's going to get you to get somewhere. It is not the destination. Understood? Uh, the other thing I want you to point out is, uh, or want to point out for you is that it will help you with mental blocks and getting those things out of the way, especially when you're getting into now, a lot of my examples here are about stories and stuff, but from a marketing perspective, I know how hard it is when you're coming up with content to come up with great ideas, and you'll have mental blocks that you'll experience from time to time, and this is where AI is going to help quite a bit. All right, so let's jump into it. Why is prompting an art? Well, chatbots are transformer-based languages, and they're trained to generate human-like responses, to understand uh, the technicality of it when you look at something like ChatGPT or any of these AIs, uh, most of them are really just based, based on math. And what it's doing is it's taking a probability score based on conversations it's had. Now, the most recent version of ChatGPT is about 560 gigabytes of information. And this is all text coming from conversations online, Wikipedia, different articles, and all, all of the kind of historical stuff that you could probably expect it to know up until September 2021. Anything after September 2021, it's probably not going to have the most recent information if it has anything at all. Now that's going to change in future versions, but uh, for now, just keep that in mind. If you're ever asking it something that's after September 2021, it's probably not gonna know the answer. So getting back to this, it's going to look at those words as they're used in conversation in a human uh, tone, and it's going to suggest, based on those mathematical formulas, what the next word is. And so while it looks like a very specific uh, answer to your answer, it's really just kind of shuffling these words around one at a time, just really, really super fast to put out that sentence for you. So sometimes it will come out as something straight up plagiarized from something else. Another thing it can do is it'll come up with something that it, it imagines uh, it won't know the answer. And so it'll just make something up. And so always fact checked as well. All right. So with a couple of those things in mind, let's uh, let's get to specifics. The more specific you are, the better your response. Let's get to it. All right. Here's our goal to create high quality, informative and engaged prompts optimi optimized to elicit relevant uh, and accurate responses from conversational AI models. Uh, there we go. Chat GPT is like a calculator for words. I actually wish I remember who said this because it's a great quote. Uh, it's a great way of looking at how any of these AIs work. Again, I'm talking a lot about Chat GPT, but this can happen for any of the, uh, if you're using Jasper or if you're using any number of the other ones that are out there. In fact, at the end, I'll, I'll kind of make some suggestions for you, some other tools that you can use in addition. But for sake of this argument, uh, we're just going to talk about Chat GPT. And it is, AI is like a calculator for words. Let's talk about chat GPT-4. We kind of mentioned a couple of these things earlier, but I'll jump into the 
max prompt length is about 4,000 characters, and that's roughly around 1,000 words. The max prompt answer that we'll give you is a roughly 2,000 characters. Now, this can fluctuate. You can get into situations where it might get longer than that, and I'll talk about that here in a little, uh, little bit. Uh, max words per response is about 25,000 words. Short-term memory is about 64,000 words. In other words, while you're going through the conversation with your AI, especially when you're trying to train it, over time, it will start to forget the things that you've trained it. So you oftentimes, and this is one thing I do, I'll have like a Google Word uh, or a, a Google Doc open or Microsoft Word. And I every time I try to train the AI, I will take that uh, prompt that I create and I'll paste it into that document. So if I ever have to retrain it, and again, I'll show you how to do this in a little bit, but when you have to retrain it, it's nice to just have it all right there so you can have it get right back to where it started. All right, so how long are conversations available? About 30 days. Uh, recently, we've seen that that's actually, they're starting to extend that now. So you might actually have conversations that you've created more than 30 days and it'll keep it for you, which is quite nice. Memory cutoff, like I said earlier, anything post September 2021, uh, 2021, sorry, is probably not going to be within the memory of ChatGPT. Uh, short prompts. These are just the abbreviated versions. Continue. So as I mentioned before, sometimes you're going to have a response and it'll stop in the middle of a sentence. Uh, like I said, it kind of caps it off at about 2,048 characters. If it does do that, and you will see it just kind of like end without like a, a true resolve or looks like, you know, it stopped in mid-sentence, it's as simple as just typing in continue. You can always use like go on or keep going. Those kind of work too, but continue seems to be the one that I, I most frequently use. And it'll just pick up the thread where it left off. Now, if it doesn't quite capture it, uh, it, like it starts a whole new thought or something, you can go ahead and stop the prompt and then go back to correct, to correct the prompt and say, continue from, and then in quotes, put the last remaining text that it gave you. And then it will pick up where it left off on that. Now I see there's a something in chat here. Why companies take ideas and don't respond after working on it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of times it can be time. Uh, well, I'm not sure if that even, okay, we'll come back to that. Keep going. Expand. Now you see sometimes uh, a bare bones response will come in and you'll want to flesh it out. So it's as simple as ty typing in elaborate or expand. Just single word uh, prompts can actually do wonders. Another one is analyze. And in a little bit, I'm gonna actually show you how this can be super, super beneficial. Analyze is for when you want to get something out of a text, say the tone, or perhaps you wanna get uh, sources. You can actually ask it to analyze for, and then put in the output that you want, and then hold down shift, hit return, and then in, paste in the, uh, the text that you want it to analyze, and it'll break that down. Now, as an example, I put here analyzing for style, voice, and tone. So in this case, I, I just grabbed some text I found online and it uh, I even framed it here for you so you can kind of see what I meant when I uh, you do your shift return. Analyze for style, voice, and tone, and then it gives you the context. Once you hit that little purple uh, button there, it will go ahead and give you a summary of the style, voice, and tone that you can then around, turn around later and turn into something useful. Summarize. Again, same sort of thing. You might have a whole lot of copy and you don't want to use all of it. This is just too much. So you can say summarize and it'll give you a smaller version of its answers. So let's talk about the kinds of prompts. There's an instructional prompt. Now this elicits a command. It can guide the AI to produce exactly what you want if you know what it is you want. So you could say, you know, list out 10 benefits of exercise or in a marketing perspective, you can say, you know, what are 10 things that 
businesses are struggling with in um, marketing automation. And it can give you ideas for what to write about. Um, this can also be very helpful when you're looking at uh, best practices for writing emails. What are uh, 10 best intros to get people's attention uh, on email? Things like that. It, it's very simple to just put those kinds of prompts in there and ask it specifically what it is that you want. And then from there, you can actually tweak it. Going into the exploratory prompts, this is when you want to get a starting point. You're trying to imagine uh, the content. As I said earlier, maybe you're trying to prompt it to get ideas for uh, what people are struggling with in their email or their marketing automation. Uh, I put in here a couple, you know, just funny little things here. What would it be like if humans could fly? Describe a day in the life of a sentient robot. It's those kind of things where you can just ask the AI just to kind of make stuff up. And that can be really fun when you're trying to do something creative. Hey, Marcus, I just want to jump in that we yeah. weren't actually seeing your slide move there. Just wanted to let you know. Okay. Should I jump out and jump back in? Yeah, maybe yeah. just uh, stop share. Oh, there we go. I'm just now yeah. seeing scaffolding prompts. Okay. All right. So when did it leave off? I'm not quite sure. So maybe if you just want to take it from wherever you left off, that would be great. So the kind of prompts, talked about the instructional prompts, exploratory. Maybe I just keep it like this if this is Yeah, that's works. perfect. Okay. Uh, scaffolding prompts. This is when you need to build a framework or a structure around something. So maybe you want to start, again, I'm just do, using like a small um, or a short story uh, version to kind of give you an illustration. But again, you can use this for any sort of um, uh, creative writing that you're doing, whether it's for marketing, whether it's for business, whether it's for content. Uh, in this case, I said, starting from a small dispute in a tiny village, outline a massive world-changing conflict. Again, really loose-ended. Uh, this can be really fun for when you're just trying to just create an idea around something. Now, in a marketing perspective, perhaps you're trying to look at something specific about like how to use AI, or you can ask it a very specific question about, um, you know, best practices. Um, any sort of uh, situation where you're just stumped or you're just looking for creative um, inspiration this is where you're going to ask those prompts and you can scaffold them on top of each other. And then each time you ask those questions, you just get a little bit deeper, a little bit more detailed. Then you have interactive prompts. Now this can create interactions for engagement. Like you're, again, just like the scaffolding prompt, you're trying to brainstorm, you're trying to come up with concepts. Uh, you can ask the AI like it's your personal friend. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about mega prompts here in a little bit, and I'll actually talk to you about personas, how you can ask the AI to assume a persona and then answer you in the, the essence, I guess you would say, the ethos of that persona. So maybe it's a professor, maybe it's your editor, maybe it's your boss. You can ask the AI to take that certain tone or that certain position in order to uh, answer your question and get it in a perspective of that persona. Uh, so again, that's the interactive prompts. Now we're gonna jump into advanced prompt crafting. This is where we start stacking them together. First of all, let me jump into some chats here. If there's any other questions here, uh, can you move your slides? Oh yeah, well, I did. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. Um, if ChatGPT is being used to write a book, it is the computer-generated book, not by human author. Can you please elaborate on this? Yes, I can. So the idea is that when you're writing a book, it's about the perspective of getting that inspiration. It's not so that the AI actually writes the content that you're trying to create. It's that you're using it to create the outlines. You're using it to create inspiration for the content uh, to break up the chapters. You can actually even take like the outline that you've already created and put it into the AI and ask it to sort it based on priority or to say, can you analyze this and tell me what I might be missing? And it might suggest some other chapters or it might say, hey, in this chapter, you address these things. Have you considered X, Y, Z? And so those are the kind of things that in, in the book that I'm writing right now is actually addressing specifically. You never just 
throw something in and ask it to write it for you. Uh, that would, first of all, like I said, talk about the plagiarism. And a lot of times the AI can have biases baked in. Uh, it'll have bias. It can come up with uh, weird little imaginations that aren't true. Uh, sometimes the uh, AI, when, when it really doesn't know how to answer something, it will give you an answer and it will sound certifiably uh, uh, confident about the answer. But in reality, it's not true at all. So always fact check everything uh, that you get from your AI. All right, jumping back into this. Um, let's get out of the chat. Advanced prompt crafting. So this is where we chain prompts together. So in this example, I'm I'm saying on uh, in the second uh, paragraph there, you see, for example, you could start with write a suspenseful story. And you can follow up with introduce a mysterious character or reveal a shocking secret about the character. In a marketing per perspective, you can talk about your business and in the perspective of, you know, what is it like for someone to use your product for the first time or ask it to say, hey, my company does this and explain what it does and ask it to say, how would I explain this to someone who's never heard of us before? Or how could I explain this to my grandmother? Uh, things like that, and you start chaining those prompts together, you can actually get maybe something that's super complicated and super, um, uh, maybe even convoluted, and you can simplify it and get it to somewhere where you can actually explain it in much more simpler terms. Hope that makes sense. Explicit specification. So in this case, I'm going to give you uh, an example where sometimes you might have a uh, expectation or an instruction that you want to be crystal clear. So in this case, I'm using for an instance, uh, write a friendly email from company X to a customer apologizing for a shipping delay. Use a positive tone and offer a 50% discount on their next purchase as our gift of appreciation. And the AI will actually produce that that email with you and it will give some sense of empathy or a, a tone in it that will um, come from the perspective of a customer service. Again, this goes into personas. I'll, I'll jump into this in a little bit more um, in the mega prompts, but in the explicit specifications, this is when you would address something that you know what you're trying to get from the AI, and you're just prompting it specifically to write that for you. Contextual prompts. So this is when you can create context around something that you're creating. Maybe, again, this is in a story perspective, but in a branding perspective or a business and marketing, you could ask somebody from, uh, you know, a customer that doesn't know anything about you, what it is you do, or you can ask them to put your customer in a specific setting and say, hey, uh, this customer's uh, struggling with X, Y, Z. And we, uh, as a product, we offer, uh, you know, ABC. How would I explain how ABC will help XYZ? Uh, that's a lot of letters, but <laughs> you kind of get the idea. I don't have the exact things to throw in there, but ABCs, XYZs, we'll go with that. Uh, here's, here's another uh, example of that persona that I talked about before right here. Um, you were seasoned space explorer stranded on a distant planet with dwindling resources. Again, this is a contextual thing uh, for a story, but it's the same sort of thing that you can do when you're writing in, in uh, for your customer, putting the AI in the shoes of your customer and asking what it is that you could explain better or asking it uh, what's a way to solve their problem or what's a better way to explain yourself. Um, all those kinds of things are, uh, very useful for AI to be able to um, help you write better content, uh, get better in the minds of your um, of your customers. And then also, um, you know, there's a lot of times too, and, and this is specific to contextual uh, prompts is, and I've done this before, if you're writing a email to say a superior, um, your boss or maybe um, another professional situation. And maybe it's something that you're feeling very emotional about. Um, uh, you're 
you know, you have a passion, it's kind of bleeding through, you could ask in the con context of uh, what you're writing to say to the AI, could you please rewrite this in a more neutral tone? Or uh, could you write this in a professional tone? Uh, things like that, where you can create context for uh, how you want that message to be delivered so that it doesn't come off as something like you're complaining or it doesn't come off as something um, reactionary. Uh, that's very helpful too. Um, also, like if you're texting a loved one and you're trying to say something and you want to be sensitive to their needs, uh, it, I know it sounds funny, but it's I've actually used it for that too. Um, so that's where contextual prompts can be uh, very helpful in just making sure that your tone and your voice is something that somebody can receive and not uh, react from. Iterative refinement. So this can be uh, any one of the examples that I've given you for the advanced prompts can become iterative as you uh, ask the first couple questions and then you can keep digging. So in this uh, instance, I'm giving some examples again about storytelling, but it's I'm using that as an example because it's easier to kind of just wrap your mind around, you know, help me brainstorm ideas for a science fiction storyteller. Let's create a list of interesting character traits for charismatic but flawed protagonists. Um, you can ask these iterative questions to dive into perspectives or to dive into character development, dive into... Um, um, opinions that other people may have, and it will help you write better content for either a blog post or for customer stories or for testimonials from your customers. All of those things add up and they can become very helpful if you've, especially if you're a first time marketer and you've never really kind of in the example I just gave you, you've never written a customer testimonial. Um, those kinds of things can be very helpful when you put those in a perspective. Now we're going to talk about the mega prompt. Before I do, let's jump in the chat, see what we got here. How do you ask chat GPT? Do not make up information to avoid getting it to hallucinate. Um, you can't. I wish you could, but you can't. It, it's You can correct it. Uh, you can say uh, that information is not accurate. Please try again or things like that. And it will apologize to you. It's the people that create it, um, you know, have done have done a good job of kind of giving it a bit of a personality. But as far as asking it not to make up information, it's really hard to do. The one thing that I would suggest, though, if you are looking for it to kind of back things up is ask it for its sources say what you know can you cite the sources you have for this article or can you cite me some information about how you got to this answer and it will give you those if it has it and then you can cross reference that yourself make sure it's accurate make sure it's not plagiarized and um, you know make sure the sort is the source is credible when the prompt gtp uh how does it retain your instructions how often do you need to repeat, do not make up information in the same chat? Well, again, the do not make up information is maybe not the best way, but one thing I would use an, as an example is sometimes it will come up with like a colloquial expression, or it will say one of the things that um, really bugs me is it'll ask you to remember things all the time. Uh, you know, while it's writing out a, an answer to something, it'll say, remember that, da, 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 da. And you can just say, you know, please don't say remember that anymore. Or, you know, take the phrase that it's repeating and say, please don't say phrases like this anymore. Not that you have to ask please, but sometimes I still do. Uh, so as far as like doing that, you probably have to, every time you do end up doing that kind of prompt, Ella, I would say, again, you know, write it down in like a notes app or Google Doc, something of that nature so that if it starts happening again, all you have to do is copy and paste the prompt that you did before and put that back in. So that usually, like I, I cited earlier that it's usually about, what is it, 60, did I say 60,000 uh, words, something like that. Uh, after that fact, it may start to deteriorate in what uh, it remembers as far as the training that you've uh, enabled it with. 
uh, Gibran, Gibran, am I pronouncing that correctly? I hope so. Uh, if AI is being used to develop writing skills and calculate mathematics, it makes writing and math skills poor. Can you please give an example? Thank you. Um, if you has to be develop writing skills and calculate mathematics, it makes writing and math. Yes. So, I mean, it's for the same reasons, you know, our school systems don't like our kids using, or us as far as we grew up, not using uh, calculators because they wanted us to learn on our own and to be able to remember things. And I think what we're learning these days and where our kind of society for better or for worse is headed is that we're going to end up with a generation uh, or at least future generations that the skill set's not necessarily going to be memory or the calculation, the skill set's really going to be about how to find the information that you need. And those are gonna be the technical skills that go forward, I believe, in the future, is finding the ability to be curious enough to find the right answer. And those are the job skills that will end up becoming um, more prevalent than the actual memory and how to write things. And, while I'm at it, I'll say this, when it comes to writing, for instance, a very good writer is probably not going to be threatened by AI right now at all. Um, in fact, I probably not at all. If you're a horrible writer, it's going to be a benefit uh, just because it can help you so much. Things as simple as using Grammarly will help you, you know, change your grammar and spelling and make sure that your sentence structure is good. Um, but over time, I think, and this is just an opinion piece, but um, you know, will that make the content that gets created, will that make it bland? And the point that I would make, as I said earlier, is that that creativity resides in you as the author. And you have to be able to kind of reach in and grab that creativity and pull that out. Because without that, the humanity and the soul of what you're writing is going to be missing. Uh, AI on its own can't do it. It needs you. All right. Uh, I don't know if I got on my soapbox there, but yeah, I have an opinion. All right, the mega prompt. There's some components to the mega prompt and I'll break them down. One is the persona, two is the task, three is the steps, context, goal, format, and then assets. And so if you want to take a screenshot of this, just so that you'll have it for later, I, I'll stay on this for a second and give you that chance. But the idea behind a mega prompt is that once you get to a point where you're much more confident in how to write your prompts, you can kind of shortcut a lot of the back and forth by coming up with the specifics that you want. As I said in one of the first slides, the more specific you are with the request, the more specific the answer is going to be. So in this case, I'll jump into the uh, a prompt that I wrote. It's kind of a garbly gook, but I, anyway, you'll see. <laughs> so we're going to break this down. You are an expert B2B brand marketer. Write a press release for company X uh, announcing features Y and Z. Uh, you're going to use quotes A and B from CEO Mr. Guy, including our product tagline D and a boilerplate. Your audience is tech reporters in the AI and chatbot sector. Use casual but persuasive tone and word count should be no more than 350 words. The purpose is to drive traffic to our website, increase engagement, and boost sales. Provide the output in Chicago-style page formatting. Also include a copy of the press release in raw HTML. So as you can see, it's very, very specific on what I'm looking for. And I'm also, in addition to what I'm looking for, I'm also asking for the HTML so I could embed it into a website. And then below that, I'm showing the quote A, quote B, in, in this situation, it's just blah, 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 but you can see those are the assets. So let's jump into how this is structured. The first thing being the persona. So I'm asking, the AI to be an expert B2B brand marketer. I'm starting there. You can start with whatever persona you want. And in this case, you know, again, we're going to talk marketing. So I'm, I'm a, I want them to be an expert B2B brand marketer. 
the task I'm looking for is a press release. I'm telling it what the company is called, and I'm telling it that the purpose of that task is to talk about the features of Y and Z. The steps that I'm using are to use the quotes of A and B from the CEO, and then I'm included tagline and make up a boilerplate. The context is the audience is a te are tech reporters in the AI and chatbot sector. And I'm asking it for that context to be casual in a persuasive tone. And the word count, I, I only want it to be 350 words. So you can see how very specific you can be with this to get the results that you desire. The goal of this is to drive traffic to our website, increase engagement, and boost sales. And then the format is I'm asking it to put it uh, to output it in a Chicago style page formatting. And again, asking it for the HTML so I can embed it later. And then finally, I'm giving it the assets for the prompt so that it can use those assets to embed them into the actual uh, results. So this is the mega prompt. And at the end, it, th this is actually a screenshot of the response I got from this. It actually wrote out, I hope you can see that it's very small, but uh, you can see that it put it into a press release. And so now you can actually tweak with these uh, mega prompts and, and get it to where you want. But for the sake of this uh, discussion, uh, I tried to just be as kind of uh, simple as possible in expressing how to do this. I'm, I'm sure all of us have written lots of uh, press releases, but you can kind of see as you ask very specific uh, um, questions of the AI, the results are going to reflect on how specific you are with your questions. And now we'll just talk about some ethical considerations. Uh, the biggest one being Plagiarism, we talked about it earlier. So plagiarism detection tools do exist. Amazon is actually, and, and Apple, are actually creating tools that will actually go through uh, if you've ever written a PDF uh, or a book to put on Amazon's marketplace, it will actually start scanning it uh, here in the near future. And if it detects that it's AI written, it will get refused. So uh, I think that's a great thing. I don't think that uh, those people on YouTube, they're telling us that you can write a book in a weekend and throw it out on Amazon and just load our bookshelves with a lot of nonsense is going to be helpful to anyone. So this, I think, is actually a very, very positive thing. The other thing is contextual understanding. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, with um, when you think about the ethical situation of content that gets created, because the the source of the material is human interactions. As much as the developers have done their best to train the AI what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention, there are things that slip through. And so these can be things like cultural nuances, uh, they can be like biases, they can be even racial um, inequality things. So it's always very good to go through it and modify the responses from the AI and um, ensure that it is in the voice and tone that uh, you believe in and stand for and want to protect. Uh, here's the bias and sensitivity we talked to just a second ago. Um, there's potential harm and discrimination can happen from AI generated text. So just keep that in mind. And so that when you're uh, going through content that's been created on, uh, through AI, that you just keep that in mind as an awareness. Uh, misinformation and disinformation. So fact check everything as I said before. Uh, you verify the information, ask it for its sources, uh, do everything you can to ensure that the content you're creating is accurate and reliable, uh, not just for your own professionalism, but also for the sake of those readers that uh, you're creating that content for. Safety and harm. Uh, again, there's sometimes violence slips, uh, slips through, uh, illegal activities. Um, you can actually ask AI. I mean, they've trained it not to do this before, but there were instances of people asking the AI on how to create bombs and create, <laughs> create all kinds of things that would um, be bad scenarios for lots of people. So 
uh, like I said, developers are doing their best to train the AIs to prevent these kinds of things that happen, but just be mindful of it that sometimes things do slip through. So uh, I mentioned about this earlier, and this is exciting to me. I hope that you um, are ready for this because this is the fun part. You can teach ChatGPT a unique voice. Now, it could be your unique voice, or it could be somebody else's unique voice, but because of the amount of content that is online, specific authors or uh, celebrities, you can actually ask the AI to write something in the voice of someone else. In this case, I'm going to ask it to write it in my voice. So I could analyze copy that I've either written. Maybe you've got stuff that's online. If it's been on there a long time, the AI can actually uh, cite that as a source. If it hasn't, and you've written a blog post or you've written uh, a book or anything uh, that you already contains the voice and tone that you want, this is where it would come in handy to have it nearby. So what you can do is write in, analyze this text for style, voice, and tone, and then insert the text. So in this case, I would say that uh, you know if you put something in there, the AI can kick out and, and cite, hey, here's the style, Here's the voice, here's the tone. And I've done this in the past where I just for my own kicks and giggles, I will create a, a establish an, an author style and I'll call it like Phil. And I'll say, hey, can you write this in the voice of Phil? Um, <laughs> and it will. The style, the voice, and tone all line up uh, based on the content that I created and I put in there for it to analyze. Uh, here's where I said, you know, you give your style a name, you can give it your own name, you can give it Phil, you can call it whatever you want. But when you analyze it and you ask it to, to or you give it a name, that's how you're going to reference it. And to go back to, I believe it was Ella that asked that question. Uh, yes, over 60,000 words or thereabouts into it, it will start degrading on remembering the style and tone of the person that you've uh, created this for. So in that case, again, you're going to copy and paste that, uh, those prompts that you created earlier back in it to remind it. Uh, another thing that just off the top of my head, as I just remember this, is sometimes overnight, if you've been writing something that's long form and you've, uh, you know, worked into the night and then you go to bed. Sometimes you can wake up in the morning and it's doing it a little less and less these days, but um, it still does happen where it will completely forget everything you talked about the night before. I have no explanation for that. I don't know anybody who does, but it, it just happens. So just to reiterate, always have that document on the side that has all of your training uh, prompts in it so that you can reuse them if you need them. And so here's an example of when I've asked it to talk like Phil. And I, you know, I, I said, Chat GPT, could you write this like Phil? And its answer was certainly, let's refer to this style, voice, and tone as Phil. Moving forward, we can adopt the Phil style, voice, and tone. So again, this is just makes it a little bit more fun, much more interesting than just using your own name, I guess. But uh, you know, mileage may vary. And then should Chat GPT forget the prompt? make sure that you just remind it, hey, can we use this style, voice, and tone going forward? Copy it in and make sure that it remembers just as we've mentioned before. So wrapping up, be responsible. Anytime you use AI, it's a tool. Just like any other tool, it can be misused. So be responsible with it. When you're generating text, make sure that it's uh, accurate. Make sure that it has sources. Make sure that it doesn't contain bias or any sort of um, things that would reflect badly upon you as a professional or your company. So, and above all, above all, never let it overshadow your own creativity. So here's some AI tools I mentioned. These are uh, some tools that you may have heard of, may not, I don't know, but uh, these are ones that I've used in the past. Uh, Jasper's excellent. Um, Koala AI also, if you're a writer and you're using doing some uh, uh, creative content, Writer X is very helpful. I mentioned Grammarly for 
getting, uh, making sure your sentence structure and spelling. Uh, Grammarly is, well, it's cheap. It's like, is it even 20 bucks for a year, I think? Uh, very helpful. And then maybe there's times where you'll just think, I wonder if there's an AI for that. And there is. There's a website called there's an AI for that.com. And it has thousands of AI resources that you can search for. If you want an AI to do something, it's probably on that website already. Well, there you go. Thanks so much. Uh, any other questions? I'm here for you. Thank you, Marcus. I, my manager here, Power to Fly, had attended your workshop someplace else, and she was like, this was one of the best workshops I've ever attended, period, but especially on this subject. So I, I know she is correct after hearing you <laughs> today. Uh, yeah, this Thank was great. And, and I had a question for you. So one thing that I find is, is interesting is a lot of companies are throwing their employees kind of into the deep end of the pool with this tool where they're just saying, chat GPT, it's the big new thing, use it. But they're not going through, the employees are not going through a training like what you gave us today. And mm -hmm. so that's often, I think, misusing the tool, creating things that aren't so great. And we've heard in the news, of course, when this tool has backfired on folks. So I'm yeah. curious what you would say, both to those companies or to the individuals, like how should people, aside from learning from you, <laughs> how should <laughs> they like go about and, and really get trained on this tool rather than just kind of start using it willy nilly? Yeah, I think just like anything else, if you'll remember like when, no, no, you probably don't. I don't know. Maybe you, I don't know how old you are, but when email first came out, you know, they, they were slow to, to teach people what to use email before uh, for and what not to. Uh, a lot of companies that would find that people were sharing just like we would memes today on social media, they were doing it through emails and stuff. And so then they had to like create a policy. We're not going to do that with our email. That's not what it's for. Uh, we're going to probably see more of that stuff happening that oftentimes when companies make moves to get people to use stuff, it isn't until something goes wrong that they decide to do something about it. And I think the moment, especially like with social media, when it came out, when people started posting stuff that they weren't supposed to talk about, uh, you know, company secrets and things. And then all of a sudden the rules came out, right? Because they thought, oh, nobody would ever do that. Nobody would. And I think AI is going to be the same way. People are going to use AI. And until somebody misuses it and a company gets in trouble, you're probably not going to see the company spend the money or the resources that it takes to make sure that everybody's on task because they don't know that there's a risk yet. So until the risk shows itself, then they're going to be able to say, like, actually, we need some budget for that. We should probably spend some money in that area. Yeah, um, I think you're right. Just like we've seen the rise in unconscious bias training and things often in response to what might be a current event. And suddenly the budget goes into that DEIB training. I, I do agree with you. It sounds like we'll be seeing a similar trajectory when it comes to AI. Yeah, it's, it's funny how CYA ends up becoming the you know, the default for budgets, <laughs> but it's true, you know, it's not until something goes wrong and then they're like, yes. ah, yeah, I should probably address this. Mm -hmm. And you had a great slide there with a bunch of other resources and websites, but I'm just curious, you know, someone was asking, are there other resources, books that you would recommend for those interested in doing a deeper dive into the art of prompt creation? Including your book, so your great plug yeah. Well, my book, book of course. It's you know, <laughs> we're going to we're going to definitely talk about that one. Um, I've actually rewritten that book. Like it was supposed to come out two months ago. I've actually gone through entire chapters of my book and had to rewrite them because I learned stuff that I didn't address in the book. And what I should have done is I should have just put the book out and then write a new edition. <laughs> but. I, I'm trying to make it so as as easy and uh, compelling as it is. I don't know. You know how it is when you're an artist. You just it's never good enough. Um, but I think when it comes to resources, you know, I mentioned that uh, website. There's an AI for that. Um, that site and things like that tool that show you where you can find other ways of doing things, whether it's graphics, whether it's voices, whether it's 
um, uh, you know, better ways to write, uh, inspiration, things like that. I think what we're going to see is very much like what happened in the early days of social media, where it wasn't just Twitter and Facebook, but you had Friendster, you had uh, MySpace, you had all these other things. And then, you know, eventually it all kind of shook out, right? And AI is going to be that same way where there's going to be a handful of companies that will make it and the rest are going to probably, you know, unfortunately, either get absorbed, which isn't a bad thing, or they're, they're going to... Um, you know, go out of business and mm -hmm. stuff. So uh, it's, we're still in the early, early wild, wild west days yes. of AI. But like <laughs> I said, um, the best website I found so far is there's an AI for that. And, you know, it, you can go down a rabbit hole real deep in there. Very <laughs> I think that's what today is all about is going yeah. down yeah. rabbit holes. And we had a question there. We're going to cover this more throughout the day too. We have some topics specifically about this, but someone was asking, about AI in recruiting employees and really helping maybe the recruitment process. And of course there's biases there that also need to be addressed. But in your experience, are there ways that AI can specifically be used in terms of recruiting? I would imagine mm -hmm. one of the things could be just writing the, jo the, the job descriptions themselves. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think too is, you know, one opportunity for AI, if you're an HR person or somebody who's creating job specs uh, or requests, uh, requisites, whatever, um, you know what I meant, job recs, uh, is that you can be much more creative with it. And asking the AI to create job descriptions that are friendly, uh, you know, have a tone to them that is more human, um, asking the AI to create uh, a job in, in order of interest from, and you give it the persona person you're trying to reach, say it's a developer, for instance. Well, a de developer, and I'm being totally, totally um, stereotypical, you know, having a free gym membership might not be the top thing that they're interested in. What is the thing they're interested? In? Oh, well, you know, you get a $6,000 stipend to set up your office. Well, then that's the one you should be pushing. You know, you can ask it to order based on the persona of a person and say, hey, what are they most interested in? Let's talk about those things first so that when they're scanning that job description, they're not skipping stuff. They, they see exactly what they need to see right off the bat. And so from that recruiting perspective, also when you're creating content, what is content that's relevant to those people that you're going after? Uh, it's no different than you know creating motion pictures or creating uh, TV. These guys will go and they'll do you know deep studies and find out what people are interested in, and then once something hits, you know, boom, it hits. Um, what do we got here? Audience question. What challenges yeah. have you encountered in crafting prompts and how did you overcome them? That's an excellent question. Uh, the, the biggest challenge is just not getting the answer you want. Uh, and it's it really is practice. And it's uh, uh, the more you do it, the more kind of recognize what's not going to work, if that makes sense. Uh, so that when you you actually ask the prompt, uh, my experience has always been the um, the learning is always by mistakes and and don't be afraid you're not going to break it you're not going to hurt its feelings you're not going to you know it's just a tool um, and if you don't get that uh, it's something my dad used to say you know if at first you don't succeed keep on sucking till you do succeed uh, do your best with the the prompt and if that doesn't work try a different way try a different way of asking the question, try and frame it a different way, frame it from, um, you know, maybe it's, oh, well, I don't know the example of exactly what you're trying to craft, but you know what I'm saying? Think of other ways to ask the same things and see what it comes up with. Uh, how can AI be leveraged to simulate the decision-making process and tasks of a project manager or software engineer? And what are the potential benefits and challenges associated with using AI in these professional roles? Excellent, excellent, excellent question. Okay. Remember when we were talking about the mega prompt and you can ask it and put it into a persona? This is exactly what we're talking about. You can say, hey, you are a project manager and you need to be able to cite the benefits for, you know, this project 
uh, and go through the exact thing. What's the task? What's the output? Is it, do you want a presentation? Do you want the output to be a PDF? Do you want the output to be a, um, a blog post? Put it in the in that framework of the mega prompt that I offered you that I asked you, you know, if you didn't screenshot it again, I, I'll, I can probably get it to Rob or somebody and they can share it later. But um, that framework will help so much in getting, you know, what you're asking there, the benefits, the challenges associated with the AI by just putting it in the perspective and persona of the person you're trying to get it to come from. Could you share a personal anecdote or experience where a prompt led to unexpected insights or transformations? Yes, I was writing a book uh, about ChatGPT and how to write a book with ChatGPT. And I wrote out an outline and then uh, asked it uh, to review the outline and offer suggestions. And the suggestions that came back, this is early, early on in the book. I had, I, I believe it was 13 chapters. And then it added all of these other chapters that it suggested about, um, you know, how to self-publish a book. Uh, what are the resources out there for self-publishing? What are resources for graphic design? What are resources for um, um, editing? It, and it would go like, you know, try Fiverr, try, you know, 99 designs. And it would give all these, you know, different things and say, put this in the appendix. And so I, I started doing that. I started putting these things in the appendix and I said, it changed the whole course of the value of the book. It wasn't just about the writing component. It was talking about the self-publishing. What are the resources? If I'm not a great graphic designer, where would I find one? How much would it cost? Uh, if I'm not a great editor, who could I go to? Where could I find that editor? Those little things like that changed the entire dynamic where all of a sudden the book wasn't just about the AI. Then all of a sudden I had all these other chapters that started talking about, you know, how to actually self-publish. What are the steps? What are the resources? Um, all those things that I never even thought of to put in the book when you're thinking of how to write a book with ChatGPT. So there you go that's, yeah, that's we think of ai as this big overarching thing but i mean what i'm hearing you from so much of you're saying too is so much of it is in these other tools that we have like i wouldn't even think of grammarly for example as ai because i think of ai as this big scarier thing but in fact there's these tools that we have been using in some cases for years, years. And, yeah. and I've heard some people say, well, we've had AI forever. We called it machine learning. And now AI is kind of caught on as a term, but you know, there was all these ways that we were using AI previously before it kind of tapped into the zeitgeist that it is right now. Well, even Google, right? I mean, we've been mm -hmm. using Google since what, 98, when did it come out? 97, 98, something like that. And it was a version of machine learning. Now, it was based on different criteria of what it learned and how it learned. And it created incentives based on keywords rather than uh, output. So now what you're seeing is Google is racing to catch up to try and change right now. You know, it'll be barred for now, but I guarantee you it will get brought into the, the overall Google machine so that when you actually are searching, I mean, look at how bad keywords and SEO has, has changed how we search for content and you go on Google and you search for something and you know, you don't even see what you're looking for because keywords are stacked in so many different things and content is created that um, for lack of a better term has tainted the output and the quality of the answers. So I think what you're going to see, in fact, I'm hundred percent positive. I just don't know how long it'll take is that AI will start shifting back into search and uh, keywords will probably become less uh, page authority and all the things that we ranked SEO for are going to start changing. And now what you're going to start seeing is you're going to see content that bubbles up that's more relevant based on criteria that you've already fed it through past searches, criteria you've done through your own content development. Google knows what emails you, you know, you've written. It's going, to, it, it's going to be so contextual based on you and not on keywords and uh, authority and all of the other pieces. It's going to be completely, completely personalized. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and one last question before we let you go, because I think this is just interesting. Do you know? Do you see a way, a, a future where we're paying for some of these services? You mentioned some of them right now. They do have a, a payment issue, but of course, ChatGPT is free. But are, uh, and and Andrea, before you talked about, there are different levels that you can pay for. But where do you see that going? I think uh, the direction will initially be, especially for some of these startups like OpenAI and, and those kind of companies, it will be paid services, just like, you know, if you want chat GPT, you want the latest and greatest version, it's 20 bucks a month, yada, yada. What you're going to see is as these bigger companies step in, Apple, Facebook, Google, and they are able to monetize in other ways, AI will take on the same type of um, monetization is that we've seen in free products, things like Google Docs and stuff, where it's not really that you're paying for the service, you're paying for it with your information, what you do, how you do it, what you search for, uh, things that you click on, the algorithms that watch you are going to start feeding it. And now you're the product. So the AI, you know, initially we're going to be paying for it just because there's companies that need to meet the demands of their shareholders. But until there's other products that use that information and they can monetize those products, things mm -hmm. like writing tools, things like, um, you know, publishing, things like uh, creative uh, assets. Once those things are happening, then you won't have to pay for chat GPT. You won't have to pay for these kinds of like, just like you use Google now. Um, you're the product. Mm. Everything you interact with becomes the information for them to be able to monetize. And un as unfortunate as that is, um, they own us. <laughs> just do. <laughs> they just yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is so fascinating. Thank you for not only talking about the prompts, but some of these bigger questions here that our community had. This was great. And before we let you go, where do you know when your book will be out? So that way everyone can find it, because I'm sure everyone is going to want to follow up on that. Uh, I just got the last uh, edit and I have to, uh, my editor's waiting for me on the re-edit. So now I, I've got one more round. Um, so give it like three to four weeks and it'll be You'll you'll find it at wherever books are sold, yes. <laughs> including some of those some, some some of those big companies you mentioned. So uh, yeah. this is amazing. And Marcus, is there going to be places also that you're doing other workshops if people want to find that? I am. I'm actually doing a talk at Harvard. Uh, next oh my month. gosh, <laughs> that is exciting. Yeah. Oh gosh. Well, thank you. We, I love that we scooped Harvard on it. So thank you for all this amazing information. We'll let you go and uh, and we'll be all be on the lookout for your book when it comes out. All right. Thank you guys. Much appreciated. Thank you, Marcus. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.